Welcome to Nature Calls, and thanks for joining us at the Nature Conservancy in Alabama. TNC Alabama is 20 conservationists working together to conserve the land and water for nature and people. I'm Jessica Mitchell, the Philanthropy Program Associate for TNC Alabama, and Nature Calls is our virtual field trip where we share a new conservation project or focus in Alabama each month on the second Thursday at 3 p.m. Before we start today's really great program, I'm gonna share a few housekeeping items. First, we are recording this call. And second, I've already muted your microphones. So if you uh, wish to make a comment or ask a question, please use the chat function that's at the bottom of your screen. This will make it easier for our presenter to manage the questions and answers at the end of the presentation. This program is gonna be approximately 15, 20 minutes long with another 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Uh, and we will get to all of those. Um, and now I am pleased to introduce Elena Reynolds. She's our watershed coordinator for the Locust Fork and the Big Canoe Creek watersheds. She's been with TNC Alabama for about two years now, and she protects those local watersheds by working with landowners to improve water quality, reduce sediment runoff, and to conserve our incredible freshwater water biodiversity. And one of the tools for accomplishing these goals, among many, is something called Beehi, and she's joined us to give us an overview today of the work that she does and how Beehi plays into that. And Elena, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Jessica, and thank you everyone for joining me this afternoon. It's exciting that you've all come to see my talk. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop my video so I can save on some bandwidth, and I'm going to share my screen. And let me get my presentation started. Okay, so today I will be talking about the freshwater program in Alabama. And the title of my presentation is Performing CPR on Alabama's Rivers, Conservation Protection and Restoration at Watershed Scale. So I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I think everyone on this call probably already knows how amazing Alabama is and our incredible biodiversity. We are number one in freshwater biodiversity. We're number one in fish species, turtles, mussels. It's incredible. We're number four in overall biodiversity. So we're often called America's Amazon. And if you look at our state seal, you can see that all of Alabama's rivers are showcased because it's our, an abundant natural feature that we have. And it lends itself to all of our amazing biodiversity. Also books have been written on the topic. And I think people are finally starting to understand and see how special Alabama is and why it needs to be conserved. So here's a map that depicts the fish diversity and you see Alabama is just lit up in red in number of, of fish species. My daughter there, Lenny, she is amazed by how many fish species that Alabama has. She's actually holding the Fishes of Alabama book and she loves to look through the book and see of all the colorful fish that live in Alabama. So since Alabama is such an amazing and biodiverse place, a group of federal, state, and private stakeholders have come together to create what's called the Alabama Rivers and Streams Network, or affectionately called ARSEN, which is a very interesting name for a water group. But nonetheless, um, this is a group that has gotten together to pinpoint several very special watersheds within the state that have very high rates of biodiversity. And these watersheds are on the map on the right. This is a map that can be found on the United States Geological Survey um, Strategic Habitat Units or SHU mapper. So these watersheds are called SHUs or Strategic Habitat Units. And TNC works with the Alabama Rivers and Streams Network to pick our priority watersheds. Which watersheds do we need to focus on that have a lot of biodiversity left intact and where 
a difference can be still a difference can still be made restoration wise. Where do we need to focus our efforts? So as of now, our priority watersheds are the Paint Rock River, Locust Fork of the Black Warrior Wa River, Big Canoe Creek, Cahaba, and Terrapin Creek. And I have those listed out as well on the right. So this all started in the Paint Rock River um, years and years ago before my time. The TNC, TNC decided to focus on the Paint Rock and there's over 20 years of conservation there. So over 40 restoration projects have been completed. So that includes stream restorations, cattle exclusion fencing, alternative water sources for the cattle, fish barrier removals, and then also 26, over 26,000 acres have been acquired using state and private funds to purchase intact forested headwaters to protect these unique ecosystems in the paint rock. So since there has been so much success in this watershed, the freshwater program has decided to take this restoration approach and look at the paint rock as a model and apply everything that we've done there in other priority watersheds. So just to touch again on the importance of these watersheds, here are a few charismatic critters from Bicanoe Creek and Locust Fork. If you look in the top left-hand corner there, you see the tri-spot darter. It was thought to have been extirpated or extinct for over 50 years. And back in 2008, it was rediscovered in Little Canoe Creek, in the in Big Canoe Creek watershed. So that's a big deal. Um, also in the bottom right-hand corner is the Canoe Creek club shell that also exists in Big Canoe Creek watershed. And that's actually a picture of me holding this mussel it's about to be re-released into the stream. I was there with the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. They actually have a program where they propagate um, listed mussels in the lab and they re-release them into areas where their historic range is where they think that they'll do well. Also, you see the Black Warrior Water Dog and the Flattened Musk Turtle. They share the same geographic range, which is the Black Warrior Watershed. So their, their, their historic range is in the Locust Fork and then also the Bankhead area, but they're very rare now. And we actually have a program where we're working with Auburn University on a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. We're working with Jim Godwin to do environmental DNA sampling to see um, where their habitat might still be throughout the Locust Fork River. So just to pinpoint a few threats in these watersheds, they all have a lot of agriculture happening in them, um, especially the Locust Fork, Big Canoe, and Paint Rock. If you look at the map on the left, that's a land use land cover map and everything in yellow is agriculture. So there's a lot of row cropping, there's a lot of pasteurization, there's cattle operations and poultry operations and mining. And with all of these things comes sedimentation and water pollutants through nutrient loading, lots of fertilizing going on um, and pollutant loading. And if you look at the picture on the bottom there, that's a picture of a riverbed that is just covered in sediment. So this is not natural and it's choking out in-stream habitat. It covers fish eggs, it chokes out mussels. It's just really the number one pollutant that impacts um, aquatic organisms negatively. So we are trying to actively combat that through our river restoration. So just some strategies. Um, as Jessica mentioned before, I'll be talking about BHI today. That is the Bank Erosion Hazard Index. So we paddle down these rivers and we do a bank assessment to collect data to see where the most erodible areas are and the most sediment is coming from. So that helps us to prioritize where our restoration should be. Um, with this comes a lot of landowner engagement. We also try to promote river access and support river culture because if locals, they, they get out and they love the river, they wanna protect it. Um, anything that we can do restoration wise to get funding, grant funding for, for restoration projects like the farm bill, we try to utilize any opportunity that we can. Also pushing for strategic irrigation, 
like I mentioned, stream bank restoration and um, anything that we can do to influence water policy in the state of Alabama or to promote in-stream flow study, which is um, very much needed within the state, we try to promote that as well. All right, so now I'll be getting into the nuts and bolts of our beehive process or the Bank Erosion Hazard Index. So this was developed by Dave Rosgen of Wildland Hydrology in 2001. And we're kind of using a broad stroke assessment of his original beehive process. We're looking at a large geographic area, the whole river um, in these watersheds, so basically this is a procedure to assess stream bank erosion potential. Um, just to see, look at different characteristics to see how erodible these banks are and how much sediment they're contributing to the whole system. So when we take data, we assign point values to several aspects of bank condition, which gives us an overall score and we use that to inventory stream bank condition and prioritize restoration. Basically, where are the top 10 eroding stream banks in a particular river system? And then we try to pinpoint landowners and reach out to them for restoration opportunities. So just a little bit of planning that goes into our trip. Um, most of the land in Alabama is privately owned, so we have to get a lot of permission from private landowners to have access to some put-ins and takeouts. Um, also, just trying to be cognizant of how long these sections are, how many miles and the timing. Say if you paddle about four miles, a uh, general rule of thumb is it'll take you about two hours. And this also depends on weather and water levels. We wanna have good levels that aren't too high because we don't want to have dangerous conditions. We wanna be able to see the banks. We also don't want it to be too low, kind of like you see in some summertime conditions. We don't wanna be dragging our boat everywhere. That's no fun either. Um, so when planning, I always try to look at the United States Geological Survey's um, discharge map. So, um, you can see how many cubic feet per second or at a particular gauge on a river. So that helps you know what the water levels are doing. They also have gauge heights. Sometimes that's easier for me to read. Another thing that we look out for are, are in-stream conditions. Are we gonna run into waterfalls? Will there be rapids? Um, sometimes we come upon log jams and we have to portage around them and that's a major issue you know that can make for a really long day if you run into a lot of these also the equipment that we use so you can collect this data on a computer you can collect it on a tablet or a phone you just need to make sure that you have a really nice rugged waterproof case we use a tablet that comes with a waterproof stylus pen and if you look at the picture on the right, that's our, our GIS analyst, Georgia Pearson. She comes out with us a lot on these trips. That's actually her uh, putting data in the tablet. We use Trimble TerraSync software to gather this data. And we also use a Trimble Global Navigation Satellite System receiver so we can assign location data to each point on the river. This is just an example of what it looks like when we gather our data. Um, there's several variables. If you look down the right, we look at the bank side, which bank is getting the most erosive energy or is actively eroding? How high is that bank? Um, what is bank full, which is the incipient point of flooding when the river comes out of its banks? What is the root depth of the plants that are growing on the bank? Because the more roots that you have and the deeper they are, the more protection you have. So that's also synonymous with surface protection and root density. What does that bank angle look like? Is it severely incised? Do you have a 90 degree cut bank? Also, the dominant bank materials make a big difference. If it's really sandy, it's going to be more erodible. If you have more rocks and boulders there on, along the stream bank, that offers more protection. And we also look at uh, near bank shear stress, which is how, 
what sort of force does the water have hitting the bank? Is it in a meander turn? Is there a lot of water that is going to be churning there during a high rainfall event? So um, like I said earlier, we're really just trying to get a big picture at this point to see where our major problems exist. If you look at the schematic on the right, that kind of shows you um, the high, moderate, and low bank erosion potential. I'm not going to bore you with all of the definitions on the left, but you can look at that and you can take a screenshot if you'd like, or if you have any questions, I can get back with you on that. But these are the types of things that we're looking for. And this is how we get our data. So this is just an example of the GIS product that Georgia makes. So basically she takes all of this raw data from the field and she has created a bank erosion hazard index model in ArcMap that automatically analyzes the data and, it's, and it makes a shape file. And if you look at this legend here, it shows the, the length of the river and the most stable banks that are in good condition are titled green or very low for very low um, erodibility. And that goes all the way up to dark red for extreme. These banks are in really rough condition. And that's where we try to target restoration. So the top 10 most eroding banks are where we try to reach out to those landowners and do restoration. So with that comes a lot of landowner outreach. We want to be known in these communities. We want to get the word out there that we have programs available to help with these sort of things. If, you're, if, if, if you own land on the river and you're actively losing property, that's probably not a very good thing for you either. And we know it's not good for the aquatic organisms that live in the stream. So there are opportunities through the Nature Conservancy and other partners to do stream bank restorations. So we try to get the word out through workshops, field days, and field visits. So here is an example of an eroding stream bank. Um, this fella here on the left, he's a lot braver than I am. I probably wouldn't be standing that close to the edge. Um, he was, that's okay. He didn't fall over that day. But this is just kind of a before and after of a typical bank stabilization project. So a lot of times with these projects, um, there's a lot of agricultural land that's adjacent to the river. So we try to offer best management practices that accompany the stream bank restoration, such as exclusion fencing for livestock or planting trees along the riverbank to provide stability and provide a buffer and slow down any runoff and pollutants that may be coming from these agricultural fields. We also like to um, offer alternative water arrangements for the cattle as well as heavy use area that prevents muckiness and more sedimentation that would just run off into the stream. We also like to promote rotational grazing, um, which is basically just putting in addi a, additional fencing for the cattle so you can rotate your cows and it allows your, your pasture time for the soil to rest and it improves water filtration and reduces runoff into the stream. Uh, here's another example of some projects that we like to do, such as fish barrier removal. If you look at the picture on the left, um, you can just imagine that there's no way that a darter is going to be able to get through these perched culverts when it's time for them to do their spawning. They're not going to be able to complete their life cycle, so they're kind of stuck, right? and it limits them and it's not good. So this is actually a, a project where we worked with US Fish and Wildlife Partners Program. Um, this is on Dry Creek in Etowah County, which is a tributary to the Locust Fork. So basically we work together with Fish and Wildlife and then also um, Etowah County to remove the perch culverts and install a free, sprint, free span bridge. So those darters can move when they need to. 
Here is an example of a recent stream restoration that we had in the Paint Rock. It was on the Jones Farm. It's the, one of the second um, stream bank restorations that we've done on the main stem Paint Rock there. And it was a priority for our, our beehive data to fix this eroding bank that you see in the top right hand corner. So basically um, the bank was graded back to a three to one slope. It was severely incised and wasting before, but now it can more easily connect to its floodplain. Um, there was also a stone toe in, I mean, stone in installed at the toe there to protect um, the bank. And then um, there were live stakes, which is um, a black willow tree species that is water loving. They were installed at the bottom there and um, the top was planted back in seedlings. So it's kind of hard to see those seedlings. They're very small, but that just kind of shows you the, pro the progression of a typical stream restoration. So recently we um, just got a grant, uh, a federal grant through the National Resources Conservation Service or the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, it's called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program Grant or RCPP grant. So basically this is money um, that comes from the farm bill and it is for stream stabilization using natural channel design. So when possible, we really like to incorporate things like large woody debris um, and, and a combination of stone or whatever would be in the streams naturally to try to, to, try to mend the, the stream bank there. Um, and this RCPP is for the Paint Rock, Locust Fork, and Big New Creek watersheds. And they will be focused on our beehive prioritization um, funding will go to the top 10 worst banks. So we will have a ranking process set up that allows for that. So we ask for a million dollars. We expect that to fund at least seven restorations. And that doesn't sound like much, but these are very expensive. Um, this is also a one-to-one -one match. So we had to come up with a million dollars in match. And some of that came from Alabama Rivers and Streams Network partners for monitoring that they're doing and in-kind services that um, are part of the grant. But uh, we also depend on private donors to make up the rest of that match. So we can really leverage these funds and do these restoration projects with partners because we all have a common goal and we all wanna do the same thing. So it's easier to pool resources and achieve conservation on a large scale level. So another component to this is um, monitoring. So our partners will help to do fish, muscle, fish and mussel surveys and a full suite of water and sediment quality sampling as well as pebble counts to determine sediment stability. So this happens before the projects begin and then after to hopefully gauge success and see what a difference that we can make in these rivers. So hopefully that project will kick off soon. Most everything is signed for this grant. It's been awarded. We're kind of just waiting on the, the go, the big, the big green go with the thumbs up from NRCS. So that'll be coming online pretty soon. And here's just a picture of our partners. We couldn't do anything without our partners. Um, they've really been super helpful um, these are just some pictures of some, some muscle surveys snorkeling in, a, in the creek there on the bottom left-hand corner. Not a bad way to spend your work day. In the top left-hand corner here, that is the environmental DNA sampling that we've done with, with uh, Jim Godwin. And then also this middle picture is a project with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Partners Program and DCNR to install temperature loggers to see how temperature affects muscle distribution in Big New Creek. And guys, I think that's all that I have. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Elena, that was great and that was so much information. Um, I'm going to give it a few moments to see if anyone has any questions. Um, 
about any of the specifics. But honestly, like you covered everything so well. It was awesome. Thank uh, don't you. <laughs> You're welcome. Don't forget anyone, if you have any questions to use the chat function, it just keeps it from getting chaotic so we don't talk over each other. Um, but I was going to ask, so how often are you encountering wildlife while you're out on the, on the streams and the creeks? There's something every time that's incredible that I see. Um, we, we did Beeha two days this week and, um, we saw some heron rookeries in the trees on Big Canoe Creek. We saw several of those and I was just amazed by just all the creatures we saw turtles and I mean it was just it was beautiful it was amazing I mean I always see something one time I saw some river otters playing on a rock ledge on Locust Fork and that was really cool exciting yeah cool uh, this is gonna maybe be like not a super fun question but I'm curious what's the worst day you've ever had out on the creek doing work <laughs> okay um Georgia Pearson and I had a very long day on Big Canoe Creek one time where we encountered about 15 of those log jams that you saw in a picture. And it was really only a three mile section, but it took all day long to <laughs> portage around those. And we were tired and hungry by the end of the day, but Georgia always has a really positive attitude and she's a great field partner. So we turned out okay. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah. So what happens when a flood hits one of our projects uh, like we had a while ago? Yes. So that's a great question. So um, that Jones Farm Phase 2 project, it has been hit with some like 100 year floods right after we completed restoration. And we always follow up with a landowner, with a farm manager, um, just to see if there's been any damage. And there was some small damage on that project. Some of the um, coconut jute matting had um, peeled up. And so we went back and we did some spot fixes on it and, and restaked it just to make sure, hopefully it, it held up during the recent flooding as well. So that'll be something that we go out and look at soon in the next week or two, just to make sure that it's holding up and functioning like it should. That's awesome. Do you ever um, have any of the landowners that you approach that are just confused by the whole concept? Like, is this is stream bank restoration something that's well known in the area? It's not. Um, it can be complicated. And, you know, if you explain it verbally to someone, they may not totally understand, but we kind of feel like seeing is believing. So a lot of times we try to take landowners out to previous projects that have been installed and say, this is what your property can look like. You know, this is, it's kind of a before and after effect of, oh, well, I see how this could work now. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite project you've worked on so far? <laughs> yeah, they can be hard to pick. Um, not necessarily. There have been little things about every project that I love, you know, whether it be the landowner or the property or the, you know, unique way in, in which it should be addressed because every project is site specific and different and requires, you know, a little bit different attention. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for doing this, for taking the time out. I know that you're busy um, and, and you guys have been slammed with work lately, but I'm so grateful that you could come and share some of your work with us. Um, and I'm gonna steal the screen real quick. All right, so again, thank you, Elena. Um, you're always so wonderful. This is the second time we've had you on Nature Calls and I'm always excited when you come on. Um, if our audience has any additional questions about this particular conservation project, the work that Elena does, or any of our other conservation work around the state, you can reach out to us at philanthropy.alabama at tnc.org. And finally, no matter what is happening in the world, our work continues uninterrupted. Conservation never stops. We need your support to keep our conservationists in the field doing their work for the people and for nature. So please donate to the Nature Conservancy in Alabama. It's easy. You can send us a brief email at philanthropy.alabama at tnc.org and we will reply with a link for online donations 
or a guide for sending your donation via postal mail or any other way that you would like to donate. And thank you in advance for your tax deductible financial contribution and invite someone to join you for the next Nature Calls on May 13th at 3 p.m. You can forward them the invitation that you receive in your inbox or share their contact information with us and we will invite them on your behalf. And again, thank you for joining us for Nature Calls, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.